uh, English. English is not uh, my mother tongue, so I just apologize in advance for any mispronunciations. <laughs> So yes, my name is uh, Camille and I've been working at the Botanical Garden uh, restaurant for three years. And more recently, I've obtained a position that allows me to manage the entire restaurant sector across our five museums at Space of Life, which are the Insectarium, the Biodome, the Biosphere, the Planetarium and the Botanical Garden. And today I'll present you how the implementation of a vegetarian menu at Space of Life uh, was done, how it was carried out, and what motivated this decision. And just a little note to say that the picture that you see is one of the food garden that was created in 1937. So that's the actual version, but it was created in 1937. Uh, I'll start with a broader context that will allow me to situate the food transition we have made. Uh, so I'll begin by saying that plants, animals, well, bio biodiversity is subject to several negative impacts caused by humans. Extraction of natural resources, deforestation, destruction of wetlands, and so on. The disappearance of the habitats of multiple species impacts not only biodiversity itself, but also human, human, sorry. The collapse of biodiversity is reaching a critical point and the climate catastrophe is at our doorstep. So the time for action is long overdue uh, and the following transitions are necessary to preserve ecosystems and their inhabitants. As you can see on this slide, uh, as stated at the UN Convention on Biological Diversity in September 2020, there are eight transitions that recognizes the value of biodiversity and that must be implemented urgently if we are to protect human, human well being and save the planet. Uh, I'll, I will not go into the details of this vast subject that includes many political implications, especially at the moment with the COP15 in Montreal. I'll only mention that these uh, transitions must be implemented quickly, if not already done, because we are behind on the climate agenda. And the consequences of human actions have already been felt for quite some time. So if I go back to the list presented, the food domain touches all the points named, sometimes more directly, sometimes more indirectly, but all of them concerned it. These transitions take on even more meaning at the botanical garden. And so I'll come back to this a little later, but the transition to sustainable food systems involves promoting sustainable and healthy diets with an emphasis on uh, diversity of foods, primarily plant-based uh, and a more moderate consumption of uh, ultra processed food, as well as significant reduction of waste and waste in the food chain and consumption. So if we continue to talk more specifically about food and its impacts, um, mainly meat, well, the food systems as a whole need to be retaught to reduce our environmental impact. Changes must be made in the production and consumption of animal products, which is still very much present. Indeed, the consumption of meat has significantly increased in the last decade, and livestock farming has several direct and in their direct negative effects on ecosystems and biodiversity, including deforestation, use of fertilizer and water, contamination of groundwater, air and soil, overexploitation of renewable and non-renewable resources such as oil, use in the manufacture of plastics and pesticides, soil, soil erosion, loss of biodiversity, um, traditional knowledge and transition that are lost, and so on. So it is clear that action must be taken. And if I recall the transitions proposed by the UN Convention mentioned a little earlier, they are consistent with the missions of space of life, as you can see in the diagram, regrouping the different aims uh, of the sustainable development policy at space of life. Several actions that I have just named fall specifically into the categories of sustainable management that you see in green, 
especially for the waste management uh, and the environmentally responsible practices. And uh, in the, the conservation and research category, that is in blue, especially on biodiversity. Indeed, we, are, we all share a great desire to act in the face of the climate em emergency, and Space for Life has a key role to play in the citizen mobilization necessar necessary to accelerate the social ecological transition. So at Space of Life, each of our experiences and actions aims to create an emotional contact with nature, to make people want to protect it, love it, and ultimately act to preserve it. Space of Life's vision is also linked to that of uh, to the Montreal 2030 plan, which is uh, to sustainably develop the autonomy of the population to act in order to protect the environmental and bi environment and biodiversity, and accelerate the social ecological transition. And the museum is a recognized place of knowledge, which induces a relationship of trust with our visitors. We are therefore very fortunate to have a significant impact on knowledge and citizen involvement through, through the information we co conveyed in our various spaces. And we can play with this dimension of knowledge, knowledge transfer by bringing a playful touch and a unique sensory experience through uh, our food spaces. A little more specifically at the Botanical Garden, uh, a master plan has been put in place to plan a social ecological transition and to enhance what is already in place. And the actions uh, put in place aspire for the Botanical Garden to be an inspirational example of the eco ecological transition, to engage the com community through partnership and our educational programs to accelerate the ecological transition and to be Montreal's international flagship for tourism, plant biodiversity, and the ecological transition. So all of this preamble leads us to uh, what has been done concretely, which is a transition to a 100% hundred, hundred vegetarian menu throughout our museums. So several years ago, the food offering at the Botanical Gardens restaurant consisted of hamburgers, hot dogs, fries, and soft drink. Um, then there was a transition to a more botanical and refined menu, but that still contained meat. And four years ago, we decided that if we wanted to be truly consistent in the, our values and missions that I just named the two slides before, we had to have a completely vegetarian offering. We also cleaned up our externally purchased products by eliminating overly processed products. Uh, and we also, uh, we are also working to increase the amount of reusable dishes and to educate our guests on how to properly sort their waste in the restaurant. And these changes uh, in our restaurant are part of a larger vision of the Botanical Gardens master plan to have an exemplary garden in terms of social ecological transition and demonstration, dem demonstration showcase to make the visiting experience inspiring and universally accessible to everyone and to have a garden that is engaged in its community and internationally. So three of the four pictures you see over here are um, some dishes we, we, uh, we serve at the restaurant with very fresh products that uh, grows in the actual botanical garden. And the fourth picture is a re reusable cup from the company Latas, which is the cup in English. Uh, so people can make a deposit of $5. They can have their cold or hot beverage all day in this uh, reusable container. And when they bring it back, we uh, give them their $5 deposit back. Um, these changes were made throughout Space of Life in the restaurant of the Bot Botanical Garden, which is, by the way, the only restaurant owned by the C city of Montreal. Uh, it was also implemented in the Café Terrasse, which is a snack bar, snack bar located a little further in the garden and in the dairy bar, 
but it, uh, it was also implemented in the facilities at the biodome and the planetarium, which are concessions operated by an external partner. So when the call for tenders was made, it was stipulated that an entirely vegetarian menu had to be offered, and it was non-negotiable. We also have some vending machines that offer full vegetarian meals uh, that are served in a, a returnable containers that we put back in the machine and are used again. So the work for this transition was done in two times. First, behind the scene by searching for better practices and evaluating what is done elsewhere, discover new products, new ideas and recipes. And this process uh, was done in such a way that there is a, cons there is a consistency across space of life food services. And one of the keys to the success of this vegetarian transition is the training of our internal teams by not just informing them of the changes, but by including them as well in the creative process and the adjustments needed along the way. Because by dealing with customers on a daily basis, they are in the best position to understand how this transition is taking place in practice and how to improve it. This brings me to the second aspect of a well-planned transition, which is finding the right way to present these new features to the customers. So first of all, we do not advertise that the restaurant's menu is vegetarian. We rather inform the people on the spot. It's no secret that the, our menu is vegetarian, but we don't want people planning to eat elsewhere if they find out this information before they, their visit. We want the most skeptical person to taste our menu because uh, they find it appealing when they see it. But we also don't want them to turn around once they get there and learn that everything is vegetarian. So to avoid this, we created a menu that offers more traditional dishes, such as chili, soup, uh, grilled cheese, pasta, and others that invite discovery. So we have a dish that is a celery root steak served with naked oats and watercress and watermelon radish salad, for example. So there is really something for everyone. Uh, we also present each dish to our employees so that they can present them in a gourmet way and make the right choice of words to adapt to the clientele they are addressing. So for example, um, we will talk about guests guess pigeon rice rather than naked oats if we want to stay on a familiar ground by using the word rice. And we will fo focus on unusual ingredients if it's um, time for, uh, for discovery. And as, as I mentioned earlier, our restaurants are located in museum spaces, which really facilitated our transition, transition to a vegetarian menu because visitors come to the premises with the prospect of discover, discovery and learning. And this open-mindedness is maintained when they visit our food counters. So uh, I want, wanted to go a little bit further uh, by presenting uh, our eco-responsible approach uh, that was uh, to put more emphasis on social impact. So therefore, we uh, gave a portion of the harvest uh, from the food garden to organization. Well, we do this every year, but in 2021, we also transformed the surplus into gourmet products that were also re redistributed sorry, in a process aimed to, uh, at fighting food insecurity. Uh, it was a great success, thanks to the great collaboration between the different actors at the botanical garden. So the horticultural team and the catering team. And moreover, during the pandemic, the garden's vegetable production areas were doubled in order to be able to distribute more fresh, fresh vegetable to organizations and to use these vegetable in the restaurant's dishes. This way we rely on short circuits um, uh, because there's nothing more local than what grows in your yard and we, our yard is, well, the botanical garden, so we're pretty lucky. Um, 
In addition to our restaurant offerings, we also produce zero waste lunch boxes and catering menus that are also vegetarian. And these services are offered for internal and external events and allow us to raise awareness among many types of audiences. Uh, it allows us to reach school groups as well as groups of politicians or private companies to whom we provide the meals. We also are developing partnerships with local businesses that allow us to spread our vision on an even larger scale. So for example, we have developed a botanical gin with the Oshlag company that is uh, maybe two blocks away from the botanical garden that makes a uh, beer and gin. We also have a day camp where young people can uh, make a lot of discoveries about nature by among other things. Um, by taking care of veg a vegetable garden. And finally, there is always, uh, I'll finish by saying that, that there's always uh, room for improvement and to develop more uh, new ideas. So that's why we are working on adding more vegan options to our menu that allow us to reduce our consumption of dairy and eggs and allowing, allowing us to continue to reduce our environmental footprint. So that's it for me today. Thank you very much for listening. And if you have any question, just ask. That was fantastic, Camille. Thank you very much Thank uh, you. for that. We'll hold all questions till the end. Sure. I'd now like to ask uh, Claudia uh, Pineda-Tebs to uh, give us her presentation. Yes, thank you so much. And that was so fantastic to see um, some really exciting changes happening within the visitor space um, sector. So thank you so much, um, Camille, for, for sharing. Um, hi, everyone. Again, my name is Claudia Pineda Tibbs. I'm the Senior Sustainability Manager at Monterey Bay Aquarium. And I am very excited to be here with you today to chat a little bit about the um, plant-rich options for mitigating climate change or for climate change mitigation. Um, I will let you know that I am not the person in charge of culinary operations at Monterey Bay Aquarium. And um, those counterparts um, are extremely instrumental in developing relationships and um, collaborative opportunities to expand on um, ways of being, thinking, and operating that can include a more plant-rich option for our visitors. Um, and so I'll, I'll start off by taking you first um, back in time to 2011. Um, back in 2011, Monterey Bay Aquarium opened a temporary exhibit called Hot Pink Flamingos. If this was an exhibit that you were able to visit or that you heard about, um, I'd love to know in the chat. But um, the main objective of Hot Pink Flamingos at the time um, was to raise awareness around climate change. So there were um, animal ambassadors in this exhibit who were basically there to illustrate what a new uh, sea level rise, what sea level rise would look like by the year 2100. And we didn't have <laughs> exhibits flooded, but on our paneling, we showed what that um, water line would look like. Um, we also had some really cheeky um, graphics and um, just gave people an opportunity to think about their own impact. And one of the things that we did, which maybe was a little controversial, was um, talk about methane. And we talked about methane because methane has more than 80 times the warming power of carbon dioxide. Um, and methane also, when we um, think about it, is the second most abundant anthropogenic greenhouse gas um, after carbon dioxide. So methane and where at that time science was telling us, uh, you know, it was coming from a lot of uh, industrial agriculture, um, animal feedlots, etc. This exhibition 
um, and this visual kind of turned into this visual, a little less triggering for folks who are visiting the aquarium and maybe um, not as um, not as willing to engage in conversation about climate change. And so what we did was we took all of this information and um, the visitor experience and really took more of a science-based approach to our methodology around our cafe and restaurant operations. Um, I will let you know that those operations are managed by a contractor and a partner. Their name is SSA Group, and they have been phenomenal in helping us achieve our sustainability goals. Um, and in particular, um, one of the opportunities that we have had in recent years is to work with our executive chef from SSA, um, Chef Matthew Bowden, who um, was really excited about a study that came out in 2019 from um, EAT. And um, EAT is a global nonprofit. Um, they're a startup dedicated to transforming the global food system through sound science, uh, impatient destruction, disruption, um, and novel partnerships. And so back in 2019, when this study came out, um, uh, and it was a report about can we feed a future population of 10 billion people on a healthy diet within planetary boundaries, um, this led to this new way of taking plant-rich diets and elevating it to, to the fine dining experience. And so our executive chef was so excited in winter of 2019 on to 2020 um, to source locally sourced produce, um, which by the way, over 90% of our produce is sourced locally and most of our, and, and other foods are so sourced locally. Um, and that means less than a hundred miles for us. Um, but ultimately um, it was this snippet in the report that really caught his attention. And a snippet in the report that said, global consumption of fruits, vegetables, nuts, and legumes will have a double and will have to double and consumption of foods such as red meat and sugar will have to be reduced by more than 50%. So he took that information and said, winter is a wonderful time to uh, tap into the beauty and deliciousness of gourds, of leafy greens. Um, and he produced this beautiful menu. Um, and ultimately it was able to showcase um, a plant-based food menu with, at that time, zero animal sources, um, and it allowed people to try something new. Um, so what we did was we started to message around that as well. So on our website, um, when you go to the Act for the Ocean page and you look to see what you can do to tackle the carbon footprint um, of stuff, um, there is a bit on there, um, messaging wise about, about food, but not too much, um, just a little bit. We still want people to make their own decisions. Um, but we were starting to think about if this is something that we're aspiring to do within our organization for our guests, then we have the opportunity to message about it. Um, so we're not saying things like don't eat animal protein or don't do this because we know that just um, social marketing wise that that doesn't work um, but we're having people think about what is going to go on their plate and what happens after they are done eating what happens with what's left over on your plate so composting your food scraps as well is something that we want to have more of a messaging around versus that cow with the gas mask right um, because a huge source of methane is food waste. Um, and so we wanted to really highlight the beauty of this plant-based menu at the time. We wrote a blog story about it, had some really amazing beauty shots taken. Um, on the left here, you can see that this is quote unquote shrimp um, that is made from algae and soybeans. 
and um, we wanted to give people an opportunity to just try an alternate version of something that they already love. Um, we also on the on the right hand side, you'll see a um, veggie quote unquote tuna that was made from tomatoes. And again, it's just a matter of um, emulating something that seems familiar and wants to pique the consumer's interest. And also it was very like pleasing to the eyes. So, you know, they say you eat with your eyes. Um, and that's one of the reasons why in our cafe, um, we very similar to the botanical garden, we um, use only um, China plates and um, reusable cups and cutlery um, because it feels more like a dining experience rather than a um, quick grab and go food convenience experience. We want people to stop. We want people to savor what they're eating. We want people to feel like they're um, in their home kitchen eating something that was made with love. Um, and so our, um, our opportunities that exist at Monterey Bay Aquarium um, that continue to this day are really based in science um, and sound information. And so one of the um, projects or um, leading resources for climate solutions that you may be familiar with is Project Down Drawdown. They were founded in 2014. Um, they're a nonprofit organization that seeks to help the world reach drawdown, um, which is basically the future point in time when levels of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere stop climbing and start to steadily decline. And so in 2017, there was a publication um, called Drawdown, and um, Plant Rich Diets is a solution in their climate solutions library. And so their climate solutions library shows that having um, or, or moving to a plant rich diet could reduce um, 50 to 70. So if 50 to 75 percent of people adopt a plant rich diet, um, reduce their meat consumption overall, they estimate that at least 54 to 78 gigatons of emissions could be avoided from dietary change alone. Um, and that's because agriculture, especially cattle and animal feed production is the leading driver of tropical deforestation. Um, so reducing meat consumption can avoid additional forest loss and associated greenhouse gases. Um, so these, this solution, again, allowed us to think about um, or confirm that we need to continue to have plant rich options in our cafe, culinary and restaurant operations. So we have, and I don't have any photos because I haven't been on site in a while, um, but we have a kind of salad bar style um, station at uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium where you have somebody from the culinary side who is either creating a right there, fresh and ready um, salad of the day for you, or you can have your own salad be made with uh, different toppings that are available. Um, and one of the animal um, protein items that is there is sustainably caught tuna. Um, there might be a duck egg from a local um, farmer. Um, and we also have uh, a plant-based sandwich, a vegan sandwich usually is available. There's also a vegetarian sandwich. Um, there is a veggie burger option. Um, and of course, a ton of delicious desserts. And um, the reason why this was so impactful for us and why we continue to use this sound um, science is that we know that there is no silver bullet to climate change. And even though plant-rich diets aren't necessarily the lowest emission diet that exists um, in developed countries like the United States and Australia, where meat consumption is really high, we know it can make a difference. So it's our responsibility as a conservation organization who believes uh, in inspiring conservation of the ocean to be able to put forward those options for our guests, for our 
um, visitors, for anybody who is stopping into the aquarium. Um, and so this um, second paragraph that I really want to highlight here is that there's a powerful communication and policy opportunity given around this messaging where um, people care about their health. They care about what is going inside their body and having that be relevant to environmental impact um, is a tremendous opportunity to shift somebody's personal narrative about adopting or trying at least a plant-based um, option the next time it is available to them. And so, um, of course, like I said, there are things that we are trying all the time. Um, we have, you know, one step forward, two steps back kind of approach. That's kind of how sustainability is. Um, but I just want to mention very quickly, um, because this wasn't going to be like too in-depth, <laughs> but uh, a challenge that we continue to see is uh, just Americans really love their burgers. As you can see here, this person is hugging their burger. Um, and so the challenge is that there will always be a burger on our menu. And that's because people expect it. Um, and so what we are seeing is um, sometimes when there is a transition to the plant-based ground meat burger, um, people will order it, people will try it, and full disclosure, a lot of times it's the staff that go and buy it, um, but this graphic or this image that I want to share is really important because um, the Good Food Institute, which is a phenomenal nonprofit um, and think tank working to make the global food system better for the planet, for people and for animals, um, they have found based off of a study that they did back in 2020, that one of the motivators for people to continue to eat meat is um, this like meat tradition. Um, and so ultimately what they're saying is people who are, um, meat has traditionally um, been a way for people to feel as though there is, um, it's, it's super complicated, but meat holds a rationalization around masculinity People who rate themselves as more masculine are more likely to justify eating conventional meat. Um, consumers who display a strong attachment to conventional meat are also more likely to resist dietary change and hold rational, rationalizations to avoid changing that behavior. And um, if we can create something that isn't um, kind of like Camille was saying, not not saying like, here's all these vegetarian options or plant-based options or vegan options, uh, but more so we have a burger and it just happens to be made from these plant-based sources, um, there might be more of a reco um, of an adoption of that behavior. And so the Good Food Institute found that one of the motivating factors um, for uh, food choice is developing products that meet the needs of that audience, designing um, choice environments to make selection easier, and designing messages to change consume, uh, consumptive behavior. Um, and they also found that a like, big foundational driver was the taste. And so you've probably heard of these different, like there are so many plant-based meat options that exist now and taste is extremely important. And as somebody who does not eat meat, um, I always say like these plant-based meats were not made for people like me. These were made for people who are meat eaters so that they can still have that familiar taste. Um, and then eventually realize like, oh, well, there is a positive um, environmental impact associated with that choice because those evolving drivers, right? It's not the environmental impact that is first going to motivate somebody to make that change or to try something new. A lot of times it's not healthy there. Um, and it most certainly will not be the animal wealth, welfare aspect, but eventually those can be um, drivers that lead to that behavior change. 
Um, and so I did pull up this quick little example menu from our website so you can see what types of options we have. You'll still, again, you'll still see some meat on there because that is what people um, have demanded and have grown to um, become familiar with when they come to the aquarium. But we will always have plant-based options, vegetarian options as well. Um, and you will, as you know, for an aquarium, you will see um, seafood on there. And all of the seafood that we serve is Seafood Watch um, green rated seafood. Um, so Seafood Watch is a, a program at Monterey Bay Aquarium that helps consumers and businesses make choices for a healthy ocean. And um, if your organization, um, if you wanted some Seafood Watch consumer guides, um, you are more than welcome to reach out to Seafood Watch and we will provide you with free printed consumer guides. Um, you just need to contact us and let us know. Um, but again, this program from Monterey Bay Aquarium, Seafood Watch was developed with the um, model of, we know that we cannot change behavior if we tell people to stop doing something. Um, so it's providing folks with smarter options and science-backed options, which is why it was so important for me to make sure that I shared the links or the QR codes to some of those studies um, from EAT, from um, Project Drawdown, and from the Good Food Institute, because as, again, I mentioned, um, being a conservation organization, we really want to make sure that we're advancing alternative solutions to animal proteins, um, because we want to do what we can to meet the world's climate, global health, food security, and biodiversity goals. Um, so if you want to know a little bit more, I just want to make a quick plug um, for a webinar that is happening in March. Sorry, I don't know why the date is not here. Um, I am not presenting this, but I came across my inbox this morning and I wanted to share with y'all. Um, so the topic is what should we eat? Mapping the environmental footprint of food from the ocean and land. Um, you can use the QR code that is in the corner to take a look. I think it's March 2nd. I don't know why I'm thinking of that date. It's either the 2nd or the 16th. Um, but again, this is a really, really juicy topic. Um, and if you want to continue to learn about it or um, hear from experts in the industry, um, then I strongly recommend participating in this webinar. And if you want to reach out with any specific questions about what is happening at Monterey Bay Aquarium, my email address is here and you are welcome to reach out. Um, and thanks so much. That was great, Claudia. Thank you very much. Uh, now I'd like to open it up for questions. And uh, Joe Reed will be uh, moderating the questions for both Claudia and Camille. Thank you, Richard. And uh, thank you to Claudia and Camille for the wonderful presentations. Um, uh, so feel free to uh, enter questions into the chat as you have them. I have a few here now, and I'll, I'll, I'll start with those. Um, uh, for Camille, um, what was the reaction of the public when you first went 100% vegetarian? Um, and, and, and was there anything that you needed to respond to in that? Yeah, I wasn't there four years ago, ago for the implementation, but I was there for the three uh, last year. So I saw the big picture and you can't please everyone. So you have to keep that in mind you will do your best to adapt, as I said, by having some dishes a little bit more mainstream. Um, as Claudia said, the hamburger, the burger, not ham, but burger is always really popular. Uh, we also create some discovery dish, as I said, but there's a small portion of people that will not be willing to eat anything you will show them. And that's okay. You can win every everyone. And so you don't fight them. You just 
do what you do, present what you, you have at the restaurant in the most pleasing way. And if they want to turn around, well, they can. They're not forced to eat here. So that was one of the main challenges um, of understanding this dynamic and um, talking about it in our teams. So everybody was on the same line for communication, the uh, right communication. So uh, yeah, that would be uh, the main negative aspect, as I can say, but we have a really, really nice response. And there's a lot of people that really enjoy the fact that it's vegetarian are really surprised, but really pleased about it. And that's great to hear. And now an additional question relatedly. Um, do you do you have weddings or other catered events at uh, Space for Life? And are they also 100% vegetarian? We don't have uh, big events, private events like weddings, because it's a uh, um, governmental institution. So <laughs> that's not happening. But we have some political uh, events that take place at the garden and the other spaces of uh, uh, space uh, of life. And yes, everything is vegetarian. We had to, uh, when we implement, implemented this um, this idea, it had to be 100% everywhere to really um, be, um, uh, sorry, uh, with, in line with our values. We have the same values throughout our five museums. So it, it had to spread out to all the catering services, the small and the big ones. So yeah. You're a politician, you're a school, you're uh, anybody, you'll eat vegetarian in our, uh, in our catering spots. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Um, Claudia, not, not a veg vegan question specifically, but, um, but uh, related to, to your efforts, the, the, the Seafood Watch is a pretty unique feature. Um, how, did that, how did that come about at Monterey Bay? If you could tell us a little bit about that sure yeah seafood the seafood watch um program actually started off as an exhibit um back in 1990 something um the exhibit um was all about thinking of seafood and making more sustainable choices and in that particular exhibit and this was like a temporary exhibit it was only up for a couple years um, but they developed those pocket guides, like the ones that I showed on the screen. And uh, what ended up happening was people were just taking these pocket guides and saying like, oh, this is such useful information. I'm going to take it with me. Um, and so as a result of that, the program was created about 20 some odd years ago. And oh, actually like 20 years ago, maybe. But um, the idea is that there is a theory of change for people around making uh, more sustainable decisions as a consumer so that hopefully when they go to a restaurant or when they are at the grocery store, um, they can ask, where did this seafood come from? And they can look up that information in this pocket guide or on the website and continue to ask those questions. Um, so if somebody as a response says, I don't know, um, then maybe they could go back, right, to as far in the supply chain as they can. Um, and if you think about it, it's very reminiscent of that slow food movement of just understanding where your food comes from, um, wanting to also emulate that farm to table um, mentality as well. And as a result, I mean, there have been lots of recommendations to uh, work with your community supported fisheries, um, to work just within the community so that the options that are most available are closer to your um, postal code, um, because that does have a huge impact on carbon emissions. And the closer you are to sourcing your food, um, then the lower the impact is. Um, so that's really what the impetus of Seafood Watch was about. It just was from a exhibition that turned into a program. And now um, that team is working across the globe with government agencies to help move the needle on um, sustainable fisheries and aquaculture. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, another question for uh, Camille. Um, 
Are you able to dine at the facilities at Space for Life if you're not a paying visitor? And if so, are you finding that uh, patrons are coming in specifically for the food service? Uh, yes, you can eat at our facilities if you, even if you don't want to uh, to go at any um, museums. And that's the case for all the facilities, all the, the, the food, the catering uh, center everywhere. So yeah, that's a bonus. I'll say, um, especially at the Botanical Garden, because we have a really nice outdoor, uh, outdoor area with a lot of plants, a fountain, uh, lots of shade in the summer. Uh, so I, yes, I can't say what's the proportion, proportion of people that comes only to the restaurant and not at the botanical garden, but there's certainly a, a certain percentage of people that does. Um, and we also have uh, clients that come on a regular base because you have a member membership card for the garden. So it's called the friends of the garden. And sometimes they come to the restaurant and not at the, the garden because they come really often and they know really well our uh, restaurant and they want to discover our uh, new uh, dishes. So yeah, sometimes they come to, only to the restaurant. All right. Um, well, thank you. Um, any other questions before I pass back to Richard? All righty. Richard, go ahead when you're ready. Thank you, Joe. I want to thank everyone again for attending and thank Claudia and Camille for joining us today. A recording of this webinar will be made available to participants to share with others, and we'll send that link to you in the coming week. In the meantime, we hope everyone has a wonderful holiday season and look forward to connecting with you in the new year. Thank you and have a wonderful evening. Thank you to everybody. Thank you very much.